Good evening. My name is Andrew Waterhouse, director of the Robert Mondavi Institute and professor of enology. Welcome to this evening's forum program. As a top public university, our education and research activities are designed to support the California economy with innovations and graduates, but we do have a global reach. This program is part of our mission to serve the public. And with this event, we want to foster a dialogue with you. The reaction to today's presentation is important and we'll be asking for your questions later on. But we'll also look for your comments at the end of the program to help define future discussions. Forum presents an array of research and scientific advances in the areas of wine brewing and food. Last year, we had a program focused on cultured meat. And tonight, a different alternative, plant-based meat. While cultured meat is still an R&D project, plant-based meat is now a mainstream commodity. So for tonight's topic, we wanted to look at both the established production technology and the marketing approaches that are being used. Before I move on, I wanted to mention that this program is being recorded and will be posted on the RMI website next week. So please notify your friends who could not attend. We're looking for your input, so please submit your questions, as I mentioned earlier, on the Q&A tool. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the program. Tonight, we'll first hear from Professor Andrew Gravel. Dr. Gravel is an assistant professor in food physical chemistry in the Department of Food Science and Technology. His research program focuses on characterizing the link between structural properties and functional roles in food systems. Dr. Gravel's group is actively investigating how fats influence the texture and performance of protein-based foods, such as the ones we'll be hearing about tonight, and how this is impacted by the architectural arrangement of the protein network. His team is also exploring new methods of structuring liquid vegetable oils, which allow them to perform like traditional ingredients with a high saturated fat content. Andrew. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Waterhouse, for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to have the chance to speak today about the science and technology behind uh, meats made from plants. Uh, this sector of the food industry has been rapidly expanding and evolving over the past few years. So I'll do my best uh, to cover some of the key technologies and innovations that are used to produce these products. So, um, you know, we've all seen now uh, the rise of plant-based meat. Um, and so these plant-based meat mimetics, as we call them, really strive to provide the full sensory experience of conventional meats. So I'm sure we all see, have seen in the past, um, you know, if you went to uh, a burger joint, uh, you might have a, a veggie patty or something that you might say is a meat substitute. Uh, but now we're seeing what we can call these next generation meat analogs. And these are really things that try to capture the full look, feel, aroma, taste, and texture uh, of traditional meat or conventional meat, uh, right from the raw to the cooked state. And the offerings that we're seeing on the market now uh, are expanding at a very rapid pace. Um, we've seen initially a lot of ground-based products, but now we're also seeing things like whole muscle cuts, uh, like I'm showing in the images on the lower right. Um, so yes, like I said, these next generation meat analogs, uh, I'm showing some of the images on the right uh, of some ground products and some whole methyl products. And what I'd like to um, cover during this talk are, um, you know, why are consumers interested uh, in these types of products? And, and then I'll mainly focus on how are plant-based meats able to mimic their animal-based counterparts. And then I'll finish off by mentioning, you know, some of the upcoming technologies that we might see being used uh, in the future. Um, so some of the drivers for reducing conventional meat consumption, uh, these in include things such as environmental impact. Uh, consumers are generally concerned uh, about the sustainability of, for example, factory farming. Uh, but in North America, particularly, uh, the, the reason people are consuming more plant-based uh, products is uh, for health and wellness. So I've borrowed uh, an image here on the lower part of the, the slide. Uh, from the Good Food Institute, uh, which was a survey uh, asking people why they're consuming more plant-based products. And the number one response was uh, that they feel that they are healthier. Um, but also uh, responses number two and three were that they taste good 
and to add variety to the diet. So variety and exploration are also major contributors to why people are purchasing these products. And there's also been a reported increase in the number of people following vegan and vegetarian diets. Now, although these are self-reported numbers, uh, generally they are increasing, uh, but this entire space of the food industry is really being driven by uh, people following flexitarian diets. So that would be people who are uh, reducing their meat consumption or trying to uh, increase uh, their, their consumption of plant-based products, uh, but not eliminating meat or dairy uh, from, from their diet overall. So from an industry perspective, uh, really what uh, the industry is trying to do uh, to drive displacement of meat consumption uh, is increase uh, the number of offerings, which will increase the ubiquity. So if you consumers see these pro products everywhere, uh, they become more comfortable with them, they become more aware of them, they become more educated about them, and then they can really uh, focus on the experience. And if that experience that they expect from an animal-based product uh, is matched with a plant-based product, uh, then you know, the question is, does it really matter if it was made of plants or animals if the experience is the same? So that's kind of the driving force. Um, but really, what is meat? Um, really, uh, if, if you watch you know, any culinary TV shows, uh, they, they often refer to meat as a protein. Uh, but really, it is a protein-rich food ingredient. Uh, so proteins or meats, proteins from animals would be things such as meat, uh, which is animal muscle tissue, uh, or eggs, or dairy. And these have a protein content uh, probably 25% or less. So a boneless, skinless chicken breast might have roughly 22% protein, uh, the remainder being uh, predominantly water, but there could be some carbohydrates uh, and other minor components. Um, so when we say that animal protein, it's really you know 25% protein or less. Um, when we're looking at uh, plant-based options, uh, Plant-based options that are high in protein include things like pulses, beans, nuts and seeds, and some grains or pseudo grains like quinoa. Uh, but there's a high variation in the protein content and composition of these. Uh, so that is something to consider when we're formulating our plant-based products. Um, proteins themselves are, uh, you know, sorry, I have to go back to the, the basic biochemistry, maybe back to high school a little bit here. But um, proteins are biopolymers. They are chains of amino acids. And these amino acids can be hydrophilic, so water liking, hydrophobic, water disliking, and they can also be charged. Uh, and so they're, they're pieced together uh, as a sequence. And that sequence determines both their structure and their biological function. And so you can see on the lower left, um, you can see uh, a series of amino acids. Uh, and they will assemble into a three-dimensional structure. And those structures are predominantly either globular or fibrous. So a globular protein is fairly compact. It has more hydrophobic regions that do not like water. Uh, so that causes it to fold into a more compact shape. Uh, and, and we often see these in plants. Uh, they're used quite often as um, for protein storage. Uh, enzymes are also have globular shape. Um, transport proteins, uh, and, and they also serve many other biological functional roles. Uh, whereas uh, in meats, we often have fibrous proteins. Now, these fibrous proteins have regular repeating motifs, and these re regular repeating motifs allow them to have the same structure over and over and that, in that way that they can form uh, much larger assemblies. Uh, so muscle fibers would be included in this category. Uh, as well as connective tissues, uh, such as things like collagen. Uh, so, so really the goal here is uh, if we take plant-based proteins, we need to, and we want them to act like animal-based proteins, um, the, the goal quite often is to take that globular structure and make it act more like a fibrous protein. And, and I'm gonna talk more about uh, the strategies that can be used uh, to, to get, to convince globular proteins to act more like fibrous proteins or take on a fibrous shape. Uh, so meats uh, themselves, as I said, uh, are made mostly of fibrous proteins. Uh, you can see on the upper right, uh, I believe that's an image of pulled pork. And if you've ever had pulled pork, you know how it's got a very stringy structure. And on the lower image on the right, you can see a piece of steak where you can actually see the visible, um, the grain of the meat, and those are bundles of individual uh, muscle cells. Uh, so I'm showing the schematic image there. So those bundles actually are groups of individual cells. Those individual cells are themselves like eight to 12 inches long. 
uh, and they perform the contractile motion. So when you flex your muscle, uh, there's this co contraction of, of the proteins that cause the muscle to get shorter. Uh, and, that, and that is why they need to be elongated in a single uniform direction. Um, but it really it blows my mind that we think about a, a single cell as something you'd have to see under the microscope. But in a muscle, you can have this, um, these fibers that are eight or 12 inches long as single cells. Um, and these bundles are also supported by this connective tissue that I mentioned, uh, which is made up, uh, which has a lot of collagen in it. And I mentioned collagen because when we cook meat, um, we break down these structures and also collagen breaks down into gelatin and the gelatin can also enhance the juiciness uh, and, and other uh, sensory properties of the product as well. Um, so in, in addition to the muscle meat, uh, there's sorry, the muscle proteins, there's also additional proteins that will contribute to the sensory experience. Now in contrast, plant proteins, as I said, are mainly globular storage proteins uh, and we have to isolate them from plants. Uh, so there's different strategies that can be used to isolate them, uh, but we call this uh, these fractionation steps. So we basically want to separate the protein from the other components uh, in the plant. Uh, so I've shown a schematic here where uh, we might use strategies to increase the protein content and basically enrich the protein fraction that we're going to use. Uh, so you might grind your protein source into a flour and then remove the oil. Uh, so you would then have uh, another strategy that you would use to remove fiber and starches, and you might have a protein concentrate at that point. There's still going to be some fiber and starch remaining. Um, so you might uh, then use a second stage, um, a, maybe a more aggressive fractionation technique where you can remove additional fibers and starches. And when you get up to 90% protein, that is something we can call a protein isolate. So basically these are strategies that are used to enrich the protein content, but it is also important uh, to note that um, we're just increasing the, the protein concentration. Uh, these are still mixtures, complex mixtures of proteins. So even if you think about soy protein, there are different types of proteins in that soy protein isolate, uh, and they're going to have different functional properties when we go to use them as a food ingredient. Uh, but, but also it's important to use strategies that can retain or even enhance the functional properties of, of, the, of the plant protein during these extraction processes because they can be affected, uh, the functionality can be affected by the processes that we use. They may aggregate during this process. So we need to make sure that they're, they're in a functional form when we use them as an ingredient to make our plant-based products. So some of the functionality that I'm referring to that is important when we're dealing with uh, proteins is solubility, uh, gelation, emulsification, which is how we mix water and oil and have a stable product like in a salad dressing. Uh, foaming and also water binding. So retaining water, for example, as we're cooking a plant-based meat product. So some of the general strategies for network formation that we see across foods that I just wanted to mention, uh, these are either physical or chemical. So there can be physical cross-linking, which we often refer to as coagulation. Uh, this might be done through acidification, uh, which we would often see in dairy products or potentially in soy enzymatic uh, cross-linking, uh, which we use, uh, which is the most common strategy to produce cheese. Um, the addition of salts can, can cause coagulation of soy proteins or a heating and cooling process, which is what we see in gelatin. For example, if you've ever made jello, you can dissolve gelatin, you heat it, and then when it cools, it forms this uh, gel structure so that the network has been cross-linked. Chemical cross-linking strategies include things Chemical cross-linking cannot be physically undone. Um, so this might be things like um, heat through heating. Uh, you see this if you've ever cooked eggs, um, it, that structure does not fall apart once the product is cooled. And if you reheat it, you just start to dehydrate it. This is also uh, what we see when, when we cook meats. There's also enzyme mediated cross-linking. And this is a strategy that might, has been commonly used for surimi or um, imitation crab. So they take minced fish and they use an enzyme to cross-link those fish proteins uh, to form a, a structure uh, that resembles crab meat. And, and then mechanical mixing is also done. So um, when we mechanically mix wheat-based dough, uh, we form gluten. This is proteins that cross-link and form uh, a, a highly elastic network. Uh, so those are the different strategies for network formation. Uh, but the big one that's used in plant-based meat analogs is texturization. 
So texturization effectively is processes that are used to manipulate the three-dimensional structure of proteins. So again, taking our globular protein and finding a strategy to make it behave more like a fibrous protein. Uh, so these would be ways that can denature that protein or unfold it uh, to form either a porous network or a network of aligned fibers. And the main strategy to accomplish that is uh, extrusion. Um, so I've shown a schematic in the lower part of this figure here uh, of a common extruder. Uh, and so extruders have been used for many years across the food industry. And quite often you'll have either a single or a twin screw extruder. I believe twin screw extruders are most commonly used in the plant-based space. And effectively what you do is incorporate your dry protein uh, into the feeding port. You blend that with water and through uh, and, and the product moves through these different stages of the extruder um, and while it's heated. So there's heating, mixing, pressures build up, and then it's extruded at the far end. And this is, like I said, commonly used to make products such as breakfast cereal, expanded snack foods, and even pasta. But you might have heard that uh, it's also used for pet foods. So I've, I've heard this because if people want to tell you how highly processed your plant-based meat is, they might say, oh, they use the same technology that they use to, to make dog food, um, but they also use the same technology for pasta. Uh, and so I'm just showing here this animated GIF of pasta being extruded through a dye. So this is using the extrusion technology. Uh, so basically any pasta that you see at the grocery store is gonna be produced through this extrusion process. Uh, and here's just a, an image of uh, an extruder uh, at, at the, uh, production scale. So you can see how the feeding port is at the back. Uh, and I just want to highlight here how there are different stages uh, where these can be modular. So you can, you can change the mixing process and you can change the heating procedure. And that's really going to change the, the properties of the product when it comes out. And so that's a lot of where the optimization is happening in this space. But there's two types of extrusion that I wanted to cover. The first being low moisture extrusion. Um, so low moisture extrusion uses uh, about 20 to 40% moisture or 20 to 40% water added. So in the feeding port, you will add uh, your plant-based protein. Uh, this is a dry ingredient or a mixture of proteins. And then you'll add some moisture. Um, and I'm showing schematically on the bottom uh, what this would look like. So we have our native globular proteins, and then there's some initial mixing. And with the addition of water, we start to hydrate our proteins. And then it continues to move down the barrel and starts to be heated and mixed. And so we start to unfold our proteins, we get that denaturation. Uh, and as they get closer to the extrusion end, um, the, the mixing profile changes. So we get alignment of those fibers. And then finally, uh, the protein is ejected. Now, because it's ejected with this very short ejection die, uh, there's a quick drop in pressure and the water that is present uh, is ejected as steam. Uh, so we get a more porous uh, structure, uh, which can then be further dried. So you end up with this uh, high protein content shelf stable product. So this is a uh, texturized vegetable protein. So it can be sold as a product. And this is what we've been uh, seeing is being used in a lot of these ground meat products. Uh, so as I said, it's a dry ingredient. It needs to be rehydrated. In this state, it's about 40 to 50% protein. But when it's used in the final product, it gives you a protein content that is similar to uh, meat. So as I said, this is used quite commonly in coarse ground products. Coarse brown ground products are things like burgers, sausages, meatballs, and ground meat that you can, for example, make uh, burger patties at home. Uh, so these, these have the signature large particles of meat as well as fatty tissue. Uh, so they have a characteristic heterogeneous structure. And as you consume them, the pieces of that meat might fall apart. And there's no defined fibrous structure to it anymore. Uh, so these products are made through the grinding process uh, and the addition of salt is going to extract some of those proteins that I mentioned in our fibrous structure. So this uh, allows for the solubilization of some proteins. And so by solubilizing some of our proteins, when we cook the product, uh, these soluble proteins form, they act as binders uh, to bind the larger particles that weren't ground as much. And they also help bind the fat and retain the moisture. Uh, and they denature. So when we cook the product, the proteins denature. And so they, they help with the, the juiciness and also helping retain the fat and the moisture inside that product. But also uh, fatty tissue, as opposed to just 
Um, fat as an ingredient, fatty tissue also helps retain the fat during cooking. Um, so taken to an extreme, when we finally chop a meat product, you would end up like with something like a frankfurter. So when I say a gelation, uh, uh, something like a hot dog really is actually a meat gel. So I just wanted to, to show that when you really extract a lot of these proteins and then heat them and denature them, you really form a gel network. And that helps really retain a lot, of a lot of moisture. So these unstructured meat analogs, um, the, the proteins that we're using to produce these are mainly proteins derived from commodity crops. So quite commonly across the, um, the products that you'll see in the, in the supermarket is uh, they're predominantly made with wheat and soy. Pea protein is also starting to be used um, most commonly as an alternative to soy because some people uh, have issues with soy because of the, it's a, a GMO product. Uh, and wheat, uh, is of course, a gluten form has those gluten forming proteins in it. So it's really very good at forming these fibrous structures. Uh, there are also additional protein binders that are quite commonly added to these products. Uh, these include potato protein uh, because it has some heat induced gelation properties. Rice protein is also used. Uh, for example, when, when pea protein is the main protein source, rice protein may be used as a protein complement. And then the, the producer can tell you that it is a complete protein. Faba bean protein has also been, uh, I've seen this on ingredients. And again, these are just used as binders. What I have noticed compared to something like soy protein isolate that is an ingredient, you will just see potato protein or rice protein. So these may be less, less concentrated. They may have more starches still in that product. So they may, this may be another way of introducing starch as, a, and as an additional binder because there are additional binders required to make sure these products don't fall apart uh, when you eat or cook them. Um, these include starches. And, and the key one here also is that people uh, discuss quite commonly is methyl cellulose. So methyl cellulose is a very interesting product. Uh, it's, help, it's a binder, uh, but also it, it forms a gel when you heat it and that gel melts when it cools again. So it's really good at helping bind water and bind fat during the cooking process, uh, but then it loses that gel property once it's cooled. Uh, so it's been a really difficult product or ingredient to replace. And that is something that uh, companies are actively looking into. There's potential for using different thickeners and jelly, gelator combinations. But right now, methyl cellulose is the best binder that we have. And that's why you do see it on a lot of these products. So uh, the second strategy for extrusion is high moisture extrusion. Uh, it's in principle, very similar to low moisture extrusion. Uh, the, one of the main differences is that it has uh, more water incorporated. So they will use 40 to 80% moisture. And the second difference is that it has a long cooling die, which allows network formation. So um, going through the same schematic, we introduce our plant proteins. Um, we start to heat and add water and mix. Uh, the proteins unfold. As we continue to heat, we start to get that alignment. But instead of ejecting it rapidly, uh, we use this cooling die where we have controlled cooling and uh, that allows uh, the proteins to cross-link. And this is the texturization process where we start to allow fibers to form because they're moving in a single direction. There, there's an alignment and they're cross-linking during that alignment. And so when the, this product is ejected from the cooling die, we get these fibrous structures. So this still is a product um, that might, re it might resemble lean fibrous muscle tissue, uh, but we still would have to add uh, flavoring and marinades uh, after production. And now because it is a higher moisture content, it does require refrigeration or freezing before being used. And we would also need to incorporate things like fat into the product. But this is the type of strategy that's now being used for uh, whole muscle or whole cup products. So these are newer products that are coming out on the market. I believe one of the major uh, fried chicken companies just came out with, uh, with a plant-based analog. Um, I'm not sure if that's the image I'm showing there. But also in the seafood category, uh, plant-based tuna uh, is another one where we get these flaky structures that are important for the texture. So we're seeing a lot of those starting to come out using this high moisture extrusion technology. So these are the two main strategies used to form the, the texture, um, but, but we still have to tailor the extrusion process uh, to match the exact texture you want because beef is gonna be different than pork, it's gonna be different than tuna. Uh, so in terms of selecting the raw ingredients, um, you can use protein powders um, or different fractions. So example, you can use protein concentrates or protein isolates. You can use different mixtures of proteins. 
Um, again, these might have carbohydrates in them as well. So the source of the protein is also going to need to be optimized. Um, so these extraction processes themselves actually can also impact the functionality, as I mentioned. So um, um, sourcing your, your pea protein from one manufacturer might give you a different product than sourcing your pea protein from another manufacturer. So consistency is actually something that is being addressed by the industry presently as well. Um, but in terms of optimizing uh, the texture, uh, processing conditions also need to be optimized. That screw configuration inside your, text, your, your extruder uh, can be optimized. The speeds the, of, the, of the mixing profile and the temperature profile uh, as well. Uh, and then mixing different types of proteins will give us different network structures. So um, soy versus soy plus pea, soy plus um, wheat, uh, these will all give us very different textures in the end. And so that's something that uh, these companies, uh, they are profiling and looking for in the future, uh, you know, the different types of meat analogs that can be produced by using different um, ingredient combinations. And then, as I mentioned, the addition of fat is also something that um, can only be done actually right now with high moisture extrusion and only about five to 10% fat can be incorporated. Otherwise, the fat liquefies and it just kind of gets pushed out of the product uh, and gunks up the machine. So it's, you really are limited in the amount of fat that you can incorporate into these at the moment. Um, so there was, there's one other technology that is uh, interesting and it's very similar to high moist um, the extrusion technologies uh, and it's called uh, shear cell technology. And it has interest for uh, whole cut products as well because it's a batch process. So it's very similar technologically to the extrusion process as I'm showing on the lower left. Uh, you, you have a single cone that does not rotate and you put into that a second cone which will rotate and this causes alignment of your protein fibers and you can heat to cook them. Uh, and then what you get out of it, I'm showing in the central image, is a very large uh, product with aligned fibers that can act much more like a whole cut. Uh, and so this technology was actually developed at a university in Europe and they actually spun out a company now called Rival Foods. And so that's the image uh, that they put up online for a whole cut type muscle uh, analog. Uh, but it does have similar challenges for uh, similar to high moisture extrusion in terms of incorporating flavors and fats. Um, so aside from structure, there are a few other components that are important. Uh, number one, it, one of them being color. Uh, so obviously the consumers expect uh, their product to be a certain color. So if you go to the meat department of your grocery store, you're gonna see a lot of dark red or bright red meat uh, because consumers consider bright red to be fresh or unspoiled. And that bright red color comes from a protein complex called myoglobin. And that myoglobin globin has an oxygen binding, it's an oxygen binding protein uh, in it. It has this heme, uh, heme ring, uh, which, which binds iron. It has iron inside it, which allows it to bind oxygen. And when the oxygen is bound, it has a red color. But during the cooking process, uh, this protein unfolds and denatures, um, and that causes the loss of the oxygen. And so we get that transition from red to brown. So that process of turning from red to brown is another aspect that is starting to be tackled by, uh, by manufacturers. Uh, but the color of these meat analogs varies quite widely. And so I'm showing an image on the lower right here, uh, just some commercial products where you can see there's a wide variation in the color of these products that are being put on the market. So one, one strategy is to just use no pigment. Uh, this might be acceptable for food service where the consumer only sees the end product. Uh, but if it's something they're gonna prepare at home uh, and you wanna give them that full experience, you do need to incorporate uh, pigments in some way. So there are a few strategies to do this uh, using, for example, natural pigments like beets, beet juice or um, extracts from pomegranate. Those give us a very dark red color that can be added, uh, but they're gonna remain after cooking as well. So a newer strategy uh, is to incorporate not only these red pigments, but also a pigment that will actually turn, turn brown during the process. Uh, so one example is an extract from apple, uh, which, will, which will turn brown during cooking uh, and kind of mask the red color that is also present. Uh, the other one is actually extracting this, this heme molecule from a different source. Uh, which has been done by Impossible Foods, and they have patented that technology. Uh, so they get it from it's a protein that's called soy leg hemoglobin, uh, isolated from the root nodules of soy plants. 
but this was not a uh, economic source uh, to extract that protein. So it's actually, they put it into genetically modified yeast. Uh, and so the yeast uh, produced that protein for them uh, and it's incorporated into their product. So it's the exact same process of the heme molecule uh, is there, it's present and it's oxygenated, but it denatures during the cooking process. So we get that exact same uh, chemical process that causes the change in the, the color during cooking. Uh, and another potential strategy uh, that I've seen recently is the use of red seaweed. So we actually get food ingredients from seaweed already. Uh, and so that red pigment also comes from uh, the algae version of chlorophyll. Uh, I can't recall the name of the, the particular pigment off the top of my head, but it is bound to a protein. So well, when you extract the protein from seaweed, you also extract this pigment. And then when that protein denatures during cooking, you still you also get this red to brown um, color transition. So this is another potential uh, avenue that we could see uh, being used in the future. And finally, flavor and aroma. Obviously, these are this is one of the most critical aspects of getting um, consumers to enjoy these products. Uh, this is a critical area for mim mimicking that full meat experience. Uh, so flavor development arises from a lot of complex breakdown reactions that occur during the cooking process. A lot of, a lot of them are associated with um, Maillard browning. So that is the brown that you see on the outside of these burgers shown in this image. It's also the same reactions that are occurring to give you your brown crust on bread. There are actually hundreds or even thousands of contributing com com compounds to these flavors and aromas. So it's a really complicated um, problem to solve. And, and the, the, the aroma compounds are actually going to be highly specific to the species and the product. So it's going to be different for beef or pork uh, or lamb or whatever products are coming out in the future. Uh, and and the, the solutions that are being developed to this are largely proprietary. So it's kind of a black box. Um, but importantly, um, the, flavor, the flavor industry is developing solutions that will be available to a wider uh, you know, a wider group of um, food producers. Uh, so we should see these uh, incorporated into more products in the future. Uh, and, and these, these flavor, um, flavor chemists are developing uh, ingredients that, not, that first they can block and mask flavors that we don't want. So for example, uh, when soy is used as an ingredient, it can have a beanie flavor. Uh, so they've, they've developed ways of blocking or masking those unwanted flavors. And then they can incorporate uh, additional flavors that will pr provide that meaty uh, experience. And so some of those products that can provide a meaty experience uh, are things like yeast extract, which provides a, an umami or meaty flavor because it has free glutamic acid. Uh, precursors to flavor molecules can also be added. Uh, so these are, are ingredients that will then provide the, the exact same aroma and flavor molecules once they are cooked. Uh, there are also new strategies for isolating that heme molecule. So that heme that provides uh, the color uh, in, in the, like for example, the Impossible Burger that I mentioned, it also catalyzes the formation of some key meaty flavor and aroma compounds. So there are new strategies that people are looking for uh, to isolate heme and incorporate it into these products. And fats also contribute uh, distinct aromas and they contribute to the, the cooking experience as well. There are many flavor combo. So a lot of flavors are fat soluble. So not only the flavors from the fat, but fats can absorb other flavors and those are released during cooking. Uh, and, and so um, solutions for these problems are being developed and they should be more widely available in the future, um, the near future. And finally, I wanted to address uh, fats a little more because fats are one of the main technological challenges still in the, this plant-based space. Uh, there are really only a few plant-based oils uh, with a high saturated fat content that will allow them to be structured at room temperature. And these are all tropical oils or tropical fats. Uh, they include palm oil, coconut oil, and cocoa butter. Um, so palm oil has been widely used for many years uh, across the food industry. Uh, it has a fairly similar chemical structure to animal fats. Uh, and we can actually fractionate it so we can separate the high melting part and the low melting part. So you can have something that melts at a higher temperature and this can be used as a fat replacement in these meat products. Uh, but palm oil has, there's many concerns with its sustainability. So it has not been adapted in these meat, um, meat analogs. 
what we most often see is coconut oil. Um, coconut oil is made up mostly of medium chain fatty acids. And so if you've seen coconut oil um, having a positive uh, health uh, and nutritional um, you know, perception, uh, this comes from the fact that it has a lot of medium chain fatty acids, but they also melt very similar to body temperature. So they will be solid in the product when it is uh, sold to you out of the refrigerator, uh, but it will melt uh, during cooking and it will stay liquid uh, when we consume the product. And cocoa butter has also been used in some of these products. Uh, cocoa butter has a very distinct melting profile just below body temperature. So it is another fat that has been used uh, to provide that fatty texture uh, in these plant-based products. Uh, so these are really the only options that we have right now in terms of replacing animal fat uh, with plant-based fats. So um, this is the major hurdle in advancing um, these meat mimetics in the future. And so some of the work that I've been doing is looking at alternative oil structuring approaches. And I'll just very quickly sum up a little bit of the work that I've done in this area. So we've used a polymer network to entrap liquid oil. And this is very similar to forming uh, jello, jello using gelatin. So if you've ever made jello, you, you heat up gelatin in hot water and you cool it down and it's a self-supporting gel. And we do basically the same thing with this polymer uh, where we heat it up uh, in oil. And then once it cools, we get this self-supporting gel like I'm showing in this image here. And you can see at the microstructural level, we would have oil droplets. So they're, they're shown as empty compartments here, but there would be oil droplets trapped within that network. And this gives us an opportunity to uh, use any type of oil that we want. We could even incorporate um, nutraceuticals or vitamins uh, that are soluble in fats. And we can hopefully also optimize the physical properties so we can really match animal fats uh, it, you know, as closely as possible. Uh, so one strategy that we've been using uh, to optimize the textural properties of this system is to incorporate a small amount of structurant that, is, uh, that does use saturated fats. Uh, so it will form a crystal network and, and that is how fats um, structure normally. So a traditional fat has a crystal network. Uh, so when we, when we used this, um, this crystal network uh, to form, to structure a fat, uh, we got the, the image shown on the left. Uh, but when we combined it with uh, the polymer, uh, we got a very different microstructure and this also impacted the uh, mechanical properties. So I'm just showing very quickly here, uh, I've now highlighted in blue. So the, the fat that was uh, structured only with the saturated fat component, uh, you can see in blue, and this is a flow profile curve. So I wanna see how, how well these um, products flow. And so we see this uh, characteristic up and down behavior for that blue curve, and that is characteristic of brittle flow. And that is not something you would want, for example, if you need to uh, spread, if you want your butter to spread on your toast, uh, it would be very brittle and you would get a blue, something like the blue curve. But when we added the polymer to this uh, crystalline agent, uh, we, we got the curve shown in red. So we got rid of a lot of that brittle flow behavior, but we also got a much firmer product. Uh, so they actually, there's a synergistic enhancement by, by using these two structuring agents together. And also if we use just a small amount of the polymer, not enough to, to structure the oil on its own, uh, we got a, a weaker gel, but very smooth flow profile. And what I'm showing on the right is a comparison of the flow behavior of this product versus two margarines. These would be a margarine that you take out of the fridge and spread on your toast. So depending on the functionality that you want, we can really optimize these structured oils uh, to behave uh, like traditional fats. Uh, so the, the area that I'm moving into now is actually to use things like dried foams made of plant proteins that can be used to form these types of networks and incorporate a small amount of saturated fat to give you those melting behavior and that spreadability. So this could be an, uh, you know, an area moving forward uh, where we do see you know, much more optimization of plant-based uh, fats uh, that can be used in these meat analogs. And with that, um, I just want to wrap up by uh, mentioning where we could see some future development in this space. So identifying new proteins, new protein fractions. So the, the, the particularly the particular proteins in these complex mixtures that incorporate, that give us the functionality that we're looking for, um, they might have unique properties. So identifying these uh, new sources of proteins, I think was where we'll see uh, optimization of the texture uh, and will help us improve the biomimicry so getting that you know, exact experience. 
Uh, and, and this will move us into having a broader range of textures. So where you might have um, sushi, which has a, you know, raw, raw fish uh, is a very delicate structure. So by identifying new proteins, we should see more products like that coming out soon. Uh, and, and then the industry is also working to optimize their extraction techniques uh, to improve the functionality of these proteins. And we're going to see a lot more uh, in developing and refining the flavor profiles. As I said, this is done mostly in the industry uh, as a black box, uh, but we, we should see you know, they're, they're developing solutions that will be widely available in the future. And finally, I think there'll be uh, very soon a lot more development in um, the ability, our ability to structure oils uh, without using um, plant um, tropical oils. Uh, and, and I think one area that, that finally, one area that we will see um, the potential for improvement still is incorporating fats into fibrous protein networks, uh, maybe forming structures that uh, mimic fatty tissue. So not just a fat that melts like a stick of butter, but something that actually can hold its structure together um, like fat that would be incorporated in a marbled steak. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions during the Q&A. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. <clears throat> I think now when I look at buying these products, I'll have a much greater appreciation for what I'm looking at. Um, so we're gonna do questions at the end. So at this point, we're gonna switch over and be hearing, we'll next hear from Phil Horn. Mr. Horn is the co-founder, president and CEO of Burger Patch, a fast growing chain of four hundred percent plant-based quick serve burger restaurants in Northern California serving modern ingredients with nostalgic taste. Prior to leading the startup food concept full-time in 2019, Horn worked for 14 years in the National Basketball Association, most recently as senior vice president of sales and service for the NBA's Sacramento Kings, joining the club in 2010 and leading the organization to a franchise record in sales on the NBA's top spot for new New season tickets sold while driving the sales plan during the team's transition to open the new Golden One Center. Having followed a plant-based diet for over a decade, the move to a restaurant tour was a once in a lifetime opportunity for Horn and his wife, co-founder and UC Davis PhD graduate, Deanna, to pursue, to pursue a mission of feeding kindness for the planet, animals, and the communities they serve. Phil, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Waterhouse. I appreciate it. Um, Andrew, that was an incredible <laughs> wealth of knowledge. Uh, and I, I am so thankful that there are people like you out there doing what you're doing. And, and you understand this uh, so incredibly well that allow me to, to do what, what I do, uh, which is presenting this product to the, the consumer. So that's what we wanted to talk about a little bit today. Um, an easy question is probably, uh, how did I get from the NBA to owning some burger restaurants. Um, well, let's uh, let's let's get into that a little bit. <laughs> so I grew up a uh, rabid burger eater, and I probably ate two to three burgers a day uh, from every fast food restaurant that you can imagine. Uh, as I got older and started to um, become a little more conscious about my body, the environment, our communities, animals. Uh, and the like, um, it, it became um, a big shift in sort of the mentality for both my wife and I, Denea, uh, co-founder, um, and we adopted a plant-based diet um, now over a decade ago. At the time when we did this, um, as Andrew kind of touched on earlier, uh, it, it was the time of the sort of veggie burger that maybe you remember uh, at one point in your life um, that was um, made less to mimic what a, a meat-based burger was, was supposed to be. And what I really found for me particularly is that I, I lacked the nostalgia um, and the convenience of what uh, I really grew up on and um, that sort of habit that had formed for me in terms of a taste that I, I appreciated. And again, the convenience, the speed at, at which I needed that, you know, for the, the life that I had, had sort of created. Um, were in, in great lack. And at the time when we first went plant-based, you know, over a decade ago, there really wasn't a lot of options. And then, you know, fast forward to 2017, um, so many great things had, had come to uh, come to be. And, and we were an early adopter of Beyond Meat. And 
Uh, we were fortunate enough to be the first to uh, get to serve that in Sacramento at a pop-up. It was a sort of proof of concept event for us back in 2017, and it went incredibly well. And from that, um, sort of catapulted our uh, foray into becoming restaurateurs and entrepreneurs in, in the plant-based space. So what I really found myself dealing with is what I call the, the food values gap. And it's something that we have tried to solve at Burger Patch with what we call convenient consciousness. And that's really meant to bridge that gap between, you know, where consumers are and, and where they want to be enabling these uh, aspirational purchasing decisions, which is something that, that I've faced. You know, I really wanted to eat better for all those reasons I talked about sustainability, my health, um, my community. And it was really hard, really challenging at, at the time when I first adopted a plant based diet. You know, a lot of these stats will sort of back up that consumers today are, are feeling the same way. Fortunately for them, the options, as, as Andrew touched on, are, are bountiful. You know, 80% want to eat less meat in some way. It's really challenging for a lot of people to make that transition. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about why. 77% of, of folks that are surveyed in a variety of different surveys, um, you know, state that they would like to, to eat more sustainably in some way. The problem is, and where this gap exists, which I experience, is that you know of the 65% of Americans that dine out once a week, 83% of those are dining out at a fast food restaurant. And that's not something that typically uh, would provide the option for this sort of conscious meal decision. 96% of uh, a popular fast food menu, you can guess maybe which one of those it is, uh, is, is all animal products. Uh, it's very challenging to find something on, on the traditional fast food chain menu that really is 100% plant-based that is totally void of, of animal products. And that was really what we strived to solve was to close that gap. And, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, um, you know, and a lot of these studies are, are still new and, and evolving, uh, particularly as more companies enter the space. Um, but but there's, a big, there's a big challenge to our climate in terms of how we farm um, really globally, um, and, and we're doing a lot in America to kind of close uh, some of the, the gap in terms of the harm that that does from a livestock standpoint, but it's still a major issue. And uh, we, we think that by what we're doing, we have a chance to really help be a solution provider uh, by uh, allowing people to experience these plant-based meats in a way that is nostalgic and familiar, and familiar to them. So our solution is 100% uh, plant-based uh, burgers, fries, shakes, and, and we've really begun to move into even different parts of our menu. Uh, we currently have a 100% plant-based uh, steak and Swiss sandwich uh, that's featuring a, a, a plant-based steak product. Uh, obviously, the solution is, is the kindest possible thing that, that we think we can present to meet this uh, sort of conscious uh, meal choice gap that consumers are facing right now. Um, and, you know, the sustainability features of it um, are, you know, still evolving, but a lot of the early studies that have been published point to some real benefits. And some of the stats you see on the screen there are uh, from a University of Michigan study that was done a few years ago. Uh, and they compared a quarter pound beef burger to a quarter pound Beyond Meat burger and uh, indicated that it was a 99% reduction uh, in water use, 93% uh, less land was used to produce the product and 90% reduction in greenhouse gases. So, you know, for us, uh, real core to what we did was also, um, you know, in addition to the environment was the animal welfare side of things. And we personally, my wife and I just have a real passion for animals and wanted to do our part to um, uh, end a lot of the uh, animal farming uh, that currently takes place. And to date, you know, we're, we're very proud to say that, that by someone choosing a plant-based option at Burger Patch over a traditional meat-based option, uh, we, we have helped to save, our customers have helped to save over 50,000 animals. And we think we're just getting started. Um, so we're, we're really excited about the actual results that, that we found. No matter what we do in terms of trying to win the mind of the consumer, you know, when it comes to sustainability and, and doing the kind thing, doing the right thing, when it comes to their meal choice, none of this works <clears throat> unless the product is delicious. And for us, uh, what we call modern ingredients, nostalgic taste is, is also really core to what we um, put in front of our, our customers. 
it has to be something that is craveable. That has to mimic, as Andrew talked about earlier, the the look and feel and fam familiarity of the meals that they they probably grew up on or maybe ate yesterday. Uh, to make that consumer maybe think about making the transition to a plant-based alternative. We really feel that we have uh, hit the mark on this. And uh, the things that are most important to us when we're positioning our product are, uh, number one, without question, the, the quality and taste. Number two is, is really the brand and, and what we represent. And that goes far beyond just the, the sort of uh, kind effects of uh, serving a plant-based meal. But it also is what we stand for, um, the impact that we have in our local communities. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then the third part, which you know has become increasingly important to consumers, really over the last couple of years, I think we've seen a dramatic increase uh, in this uh, due to COVID and, and the rise of the, the, the delivery economy, uh, is convenience. Um, you know, fortunately for us, when we started this um, venture back in 2017, this was one of our, our core tenants to success and it, it served us well during the pandemic. Uh, our model is um, highly off premise. Most people are, are taking what we do and, and taking it with them um, in a to go fashion. Uh, we, we do a lot of delivery business. Um, so again, we're, we're looking to sort of replicate what somebody's used to with a fast food experience. The, the big difference for us is we don't get a lot of second chances. So where you may have a certain expectation of, of maybe mid quality with some of the fast food that you grew up with, you kind of know what, what you're getting because of, of the price point of some of those products. We don't get that, that um, second chance if, if we miss. Uh, we're trying to basically take a lot of consumers that are still meat-based eaters uh, and show them that eating a plant-based alternative can be just as good, if not better, than what they're typically used to doing. So we have to knock it out of the park with the quality, with the taste, and uh, we feel that, that we've, we've done a good job with that. I'll talk a little bit more about some of our survey ratings, but in general, when it comes to quality and taste, and we survey these things specifically, you know, well over a thousand, I think we're actually over 2000 surveys now, um, you know, we, we have a 95% satisfaction rating on taste. So we know that we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. You may sit there and think, well, you know, a lot of these folks that are uh, consuming these products must all be, you know, vegetarians or vegans. So of course they like what you're doing. That's actually not the case. Uh, you know, most of our clientele um, still consume animal products. You know, 75% of our clientele at this point, uh, based on our surveys, actually still consumes animal products, either as the majority of their diet or it, it, at some extent um, through their dietary choices. Um, so we have a, a large hill to climb when it comes to that. And that's why I kind of mentioned the quality aspect of what we do is incredibly important. So, um, you know, we survey a lot of different aspects of our business to make sure that we're hitting on these, on these elements. And we really listen to the feedback. We get a lot of written feedback in addition to the survey scores that we receive. We make a lot of adjustments based on that, you know, whether it be the, the temperature of the food um, or the, you know, savoriness of the taste, we want to make sure that we're hitting it on every possible um, element when it comes to that quality and taste, because that is the one thing, no matter how great we're, we're performing for the environment or our communities, people will not sacrifice taste um, for, for something that they're used to uh, for a new product. So, you know, to move somebody off of a habit that they've had for you know, 20 years, uh, to a new product is, is a real big challenge. And we have to uh, make sure that that first experience um, is, is really a wow moment for them. It really has to be almost unbelievable that they bite into our burger. And the first thing out of their mouth has to, has to be essentially like, I can't believe that this isn't meat. And we see that on a routine basis. I, if I sit in a restaurant on a daily basis, I'll hear that from two, three, four customers over the span of a few hours that are first timers that come into the, to the building. And that has really allowed us to have this high repeat business, the 73% repeat business, because we're hitting the mark on taste, we're hitting the mark on speed and, and that experience that has allowed us to sort of break out of the mold of what the traditional sort of vegan uh, restaurant or cafe maybe has dealt with, you know, over time. I think there's still a perception a lot of times that, that, that leads somebody into a mindset of, oh, that, that's gonna be, you know, granola. Uh, and I'm going to have to sacrifice, you know, great taste to get that plant-based meal. We're really trying to flip the script on that. And we're really excited about how far we've come uh, to this point. So just to touch again on, on our customer base, as I mentioned, 
still consume animal products. And I, I think that actually may even be a little bit understated. Um, you know, over half of them would, would represent the uh, demographic under the age of 35. Many, um, you know, the, the sort of majority group, um, if I'm, I'm segmenting them, would be in the millennial category. And, you know, I think obviously this, this probably makes a lot of sense that um, the older demographics are a little more rooted in their, in their dietary habits and probably are not as um, curious uh, in terms of looking for a change. Whereas the younger demographics are coming up in this culture where sustainability is incredibly important. Um, social uh, values are incredibly important. And, um, you know, I think even the welfare of animals um, uh, is really important to this group. And that's a, that's a prime category for us. And, and we really speak to that group. The big opportunity for us is really what, what I think Andrew referred to as maybe flexitarians. I'd go one step further to call this group maybe a, the veg curious, which is that you know, 90% of uh, America's plant-based meat, um, the things that Andrew kind of touched on earlier, those purchases are 90% uh, come from folks that would identify themselves not as vegan. So clearly the majority of those um, experimenting with plant-based alternatives still are, are adopting a, a meat-based diet. So for us, that presents an incredible opportunity and one that we really often have to focus our marketing toward, towards to make sure that we can get them in our building for the first time. That really is the hurdle. We feel like once we get them in and they try our products, they try our shakes, our mac and cheese or, or the burgers, they're going to come back because, because of the quality and the taste. Uh, so that remains our focus uh, in terms of a lot of our marketing messages. Um, we, we do avoid often using a word like vegan because it, it does have a connotation to it. And instead, we focus on something that is probably a little um, more middle <laughs> that would produce less of a defensive reaction and say plant based. And I'm sure you're, you're seeing that in a lot of the marketing from a lot of the companies and vendors that we work, work with as well. So for us, we're excited about the progress. Um, as I mentioned, back in 2017, we held our first pop-up. Um, it was insanely successful. We had uh, four-hour lines wrapped all the way around the block in Midtown Sacramento. We sold a thousand burgers in that single day. Again, it was the first opportunity for someone to ever try a Beyond Burger uh, in Sacramento, which was which was a really special opportunity for us. We knew that we had something. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to open a uh, plant-based concession stand, which was the NBA's first inside uh, the new Golden One Center in 2018 uh, and, and had that space for a few years and was a, an incredible opportunity for us again to market to a, a segment that was predominantly uh, not plant-based and experiencing these products for the first time. In 2019, then we opened our first brick and mortar and this was so busy. This is where I had to leave the, the job that I had with the Sacramento Kings and, and take this on full time. Uh, to manage the demand that we had uh, at our spot at 23rd and K Street in Midtown Sacramento. Very small 800 square foot space. Um, it clearly wasn't large enough for what we were trying to do. So then we quickly opened a second uh, at the UC Davis, uh, a corner of the UC Davis campus um, over uh, off of First Street and are super excited about uh, entering that community and, and what we've been able to do to partner with that community. Uh, and then the third uh, near Stack State was opened uh, this last summer in June of 2020, uh, sorry, of 2021. <clears throat> and we've been uh, very excited with the response we've had from the East Sacramento and, and Sac State communities. And then we're very excited to be opening uh, our fourth location actually in just a few weeks uh, in Land Park, Sacramento at the corner of Freeport and Sutterville. Uh, we'll have our fourth location and also what we call our KIND Lab. And, and KIND is a, an acronym for our Kitchen of Innovation and Discovery. And really what that is for us is it's where we get to play. Um, you know, well over 50% of what we produce is actually uh, ingredients or recipes that we create. So while we do use um, a lot of the proteins that are on the market, like Beyond Meat, who's been an incredible partner for us, we also uh, invent and create a lot of our own products uh, to pair and complement either with those burgers or as a standalone product. Uh, the cheese that we use for the mac and cheese is, is a house developed recipe. Um, we make our own egg product uh, that we serve um, for our breakfast. Uh, so we're, we're really excited to continue that innovation and get to see what else we can do. For us, the whole idea of Burger Patch was, you know, to, to produce a kinder alternative, but was really also to be a gateway through the burgers, which we know uh, people were, were, were going to gravitate towards as one of, you know, the top consumed meals in America and use that as our opportunity to introduce people then to other products, as I mentioned, the plant-based steak, 
or uh, the chili, our plant-based chili that we make in the winter. You know, all of these things we can put forth in our restaurants with confidence because of the success uh, we've had with the burger and the trust that we've built from our customers on the quality that we have and also the brand that we've built. And, and you know, really just to kind of close out is one of the most important things that we have done and continue to do. And that's really the relationship that we have with our customers and our community. Uh, to date, you know, since we had our first pop up, we've donated now over fifty thousand dollars in real cash back to our community, and and we tend to to step up and use our platform to speak out on a lot of social justice issues that sometimes are uh, a little scary for companies to tackle. We feel that we have a responsibility with the platform that we have, and um, you know, mirroring our customer base and the things that are important to them. We use that platform to sort of further our message of kindness. And that's a, a big reason why we think people continue to sort of trust our brand and trust the products that we put out and, and give us the opportunity to experiment with more and more plant-based meat alternatives uh, as we go forward. So looking forward after our Kind Lab opens in, in April, uh, we'll turn our sites uh, to additional areas in Northern California. Uh, we, we have a plan to open some restaurants in the Bay Area, uh, hopefully in due time, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. To this point, all of our restaurants are owned by Burger Patch, and uh, we haven't franchised uh, yet at this point because we're, we're so obsessive about quality. Um, and we'll kind of see where this takes us in, in the future. We're really excited to be part of this movement. Well, thanks so much, Phil. Um, I have a sense of uh, who you're selling to and what your messages are. It's very interesting. Well, we have a bunch of questions, as you might guess. Um, let's see, where shall we start? Uh, let, me, let me start with a really technical one, Andrew. Um, I'm not even sure what this means, but anyway, you, I hope you do. For plant-based meat extrusion, do proteins need to be isolated or at least 90% of protein to form a fibrous uh, shape? So I would say no, um, quite often the concentrates are also used. So it's, it's just how, how much starch and other things are still left. So th those proteins are still present. Um, and in fact, um, having those other components uh, could, could be a benefit, uh, but it really depends on the proteins you're using, if you're using you know, different combinations, but in short, no, they do not have to be isolates. Okay, here's an easy question, Phil, I think. Is Burger Pat Patch a franchise? Boulder, Colorado needs one. Uh, you know, it's funny. We, we get uh, on a weekly basis, uh, franchise or location requests, not just from around the country, but around the world. I, I had one from, Ber from Berlin not too long ago. Uh, no, we're not a franchise. We are a chain, uh, but we are 100% locally owned. Uh, my, my wife and I, uh, Danea, and uh, our, our partners in our company um, own uh, the, the four locations at this point. And as I mentioned, we're, we're sort of obsessive about quality and, and we're not quite ready to, to turn on the, the franchise spigot yet as we wanna make sure that the model is seamless and, and the quality continues as we expand into a, a few other markets in Northern California first. So here's, uh, here's the big question. I've got several uh, angles on this. Um, and it has to do with nutrition and how do you compare this to conventional meat. Uh, one of the points was, um, and this is related, uh, maybe Andrew wants to look at this. So how do you compare the nutritional value of these the, the meat type products with what was in the plant material to start with? How would you compare the nutrition so after the processing, how the nutrition? Right. Yeah, how, how does the nutritional value change as a result of the processing? Um, of the protein component or of the overall product, I guess. I can, I guess, uh, talk to you. Well, they don't actually, they're not specific. So I assume it would be the protein. Yeah, so I guess there's, you know, di the digestion processes uh, involve things like enzymes that need to break down our proteins um, and starches uh, or more complex carbohydrates. So these processing uh, procedures can uh, help start to break down these, some of these uh, molecules 
So th they can increase uh, bioavailability. Uh, I, I've heard that, uh, but you know, I wouldn't say that it's more digest. I don't know <laughs> exactly. I'm not a nutritionist. I will say that. Um, uh, but oh yeah, they, they can potentially help break down, uh, for example, some of the proteins. Um, so it could potentially uh, increase bioavailability. Um, but overall, yeah, it's not something that I have personally looked into. So Bill, do you have any comments about this? No, I'm, I'm definitely not a scientist. I know what tastes good. <laughs> Uh, and I know how I feel afterwards, just as, as an aside, um, you know, I, I certainly I remember feeling very kind of weighted down, uh, sluggish after eating uh, the traditional sort of fast food that, that I grew up on and when I made the transition to a, a plant based diet. And, and I, I will say I eat Burger Patch probably five times a week. Um, no joke. Uh, our office is, is right next to the restaurant. Um, I, I don't have those same those same sluggish uh, feelings anymore. So I, I feel like my body's processing it very well. All right. Now here, I've gotten a couple of questions which seem odd to me, but let me just put it out there. Are there meatless burgers that don't taste like meat? <laughs> <laughs> for, for people who, who don't care, so, I mean, they're not looking for a meat substitute. Yeah, th there are, Andrew, I'm sure you have, have something to add here too. There definitely are. Um, that's not necessarily the, the market that we are appealing to. You know, our, our product was really meant to recreate the nostalgia of, of a fast food experience that somebody is more familiar with. And, and that certainly includes taste. As I mentioned, though, there, there are certainly prior to all the new alternatives that have come on the market now, there were many other um, sort of more vegetable forward uh, you know, plant-based burger alternatives um, that still exist in the market. You know, if you, you walk down your freezer aisle, you'll still see, see some of those. I don't think they have the share of space that, that the other alternatives do at this point, but they, they do still exist. Yeah, I would echo that sentiment. I believe I, you know, went to the grocery store to make sure I wasn't getting the ingredients wrong and I went past some black bean burgers. So, right. But they're, they're not trying to mimic the experience um, without the flavor. So, that, you know, it's, it's either the one that wants to be meat or, you know, one that is more of a traditional meat alternative option. Which... Right. right. Okay. So here's a couple for you, Andrew. Um, is there research on shrimp-like texture? It has a really crunchy uh, texture to it. And then... Um, Combined with that, I guess, what role do engineers play in creating these alternative products? I guess that's up your alley. I have seen that there is a like full piece of shrimp product that is out, and it appears to be a combination of proteins and polysaccharides. Uh, so I don't know if they use a similar strategy uh, with, like you see with uh, imitation crab meat. Uh, or, or if it's an extruded product, but it appears to be a whole piece that acts like a whole piece of shrimp. Um, so someone has been working on that. Yeah. It's actually a product we have in our freezer right now that, that we are experimenting with. Okay. Um, do you know how they make it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, in terms of what role engineers play, I think that's a great question. And um, I think in optimizing all these uh, texturization processes, that really is, um, you know, a problem for food engineers that are, you know, making all the major process progress there. It's a lot of um, understanding the, you know, the fluid mechanics as things move through these machines. So that that really is in the sphere of uh, food engineer. So, so Philip, uh, here's an interesting question. What about the cost comparison of of these products versus animal-based? Are there challenges in reducing the costs of these plant-based products these days? Yes, this is the holy grail for us. So, you know, on one of my slides, I, I sort of showed the, the drivers of the, the consumer's purchasing decisions, quality, you know, taste being one, brand uh, loyalty awareness being another. Price is, is probably the number two driver, you know, uh, right next to quality. Uh, for us, that is a, a daily challenge uh, because of, of, you know, the, the wide availability 
uh, of the animal um, options that are out there um, and, you know, subsidies and, and many other things that exist to help bring down the price um, of, of some of those commodities. You know, for us, uh, it's still a, a lot of new technology, a lot of new products that we're using. Uh, and like any new product, new technology, the price, um, you know, initial entry uh, usually starts a little bit higher and begins to come down over time. And we started to see that. Uh, we started to, you know, again, based on some of our volume and scale, uh, be able to make a lot of adjustments, um, offer a lot of specials as a, as a, for instance, over the last 10 days uh, or more, our, our steak, uh, steak and Swiss product that we've been serving, uh, we've been able to serve it for $4.99. Uh, that's a huge uh, milestone for us to be able to achieve, to have, you know, a core burger menu on a, a menu item. Uh, to be offered under $5 for um, uh, a large amount of time. We do have a burger on our menu um, that's sort of a, a trimmed down version of, of the original one that we serve that is also $4.99 all the time. You know, so for us, it's constantly a marketing effort of how we, you know, package some of our items or offer discounts to our loyal customers through, you know, emails or text messages that allow them to experience the product. Um, you know, for 20 or 30% off at sometimes um, at, at select opportunities. So maybe for those who really want to eat this on a daily basis, if they could, um, it's giving them an opportunity to do it at least, you know, every so often. Um, but like I said, that really is the holy grail for us. It's, it's sort of the fourth pillar holding up the table. And if, if we can continue to work with our partners, uh, which is really where it starts to help bring down the cost of, of these alternatives, we don't really feel like there's anything that that is standing in our way of, of becoming a, a household name and, and having a burger patch on on a corner next to every sort of traditional fast food joint that, that you're aware of now. Well, that's good. We got another call out here. Somebody wants one in SoCal. So, <laughs> um, Andrew, uh, someone here is asking about 3D printing an animal meat structure. Is that is that going to be how this is going to, these things are going to be created with 3D printing? I mean, I can't predict the future, but uh, I know that, yes, research is being done in that area. Um, I mean, it's got its own set of challenges uh, in terms of, you know, how, how thick things need to be to, to be printed out. And I mean, it does provide different opportunities in terms of like, getting that marble texture, or maybe if you had something like fish, like salmon, which has layers of you know, the meat and then the fat. So if you, if you want those types of structures, those, those are areas where that could potentially excel. Um, so I don't know what progress is being made and, and how rapid it's advancing, but for sure people are, are, are doing work in that area. All right, well, we're gonna have to wrap up here pretty quick. I have one more question for you, Phil. Um, <clears throat> If uh, cultured meat becomes a commercial reality, uh, will, will you consider selling that at Burger Patch? I think this is an interesting question. Great question. Uh, we've we began to wrestle with this, uh, at least I have in, in my mind. Um, I follow it closely. I follow a couple of the companies who are on the, the cutting edge of this, and I'm watching some of the initial rollouts. Um, at this time, I would say it's not on the menu at Burger Patch. Um, but one of the things that, that's helped us be successful is, is remaining flexible um, and, and understanding more about how those products are produced. Um, you know, for us, the animal welfare side of things uh, will always remain core to what we do. So, you know, understanding more about the impact of, of that on animals is, is important before we would ever cross that bridge. All right. Well, I think we've, we've run out of time here, but I'll give you one more Andrew, I don't know if you have any closing comments before we head off. No, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, Phil? No, just come visit us. Come, come try for yourself if you haven't had a chance to do it yet. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. I'll say, good, say goodbye for now. And um, we'll move on to, uh, I'll move on to a few closing comments. Um, Next month, we'll be hosting a Sips and Bites. It'll be a wine tasting. Please check your email. You'll get a message about that next week. Um, in case you missed it, we had a very popular a wine business lecture with Martha Stuman, who described her approach to building a national, a natural wine brand 
you can see her talk on our website. I'd also like to call out a, a thanks to our friends and supporters <clears throat> who helped provide the means for this program. And on your way out, please fill out our brief survey to help guide uh, future programs. And finally, uh, I hope you enjoyed this evening's program. Thank you very much. Good night.